This video is probably my most time invested model to date, and I have spent a lot of time on models in the past. So in this video, I wanted to give the Chaos Knight the best conversion somebody could do. But in order to get through the video, we're going to have to break this into multiple sections. We'll focus on the building and crafting, the painting, the detailing, weathering, and then the basing. So let's get ready to go on this night's journey. Now we've got the intro out the way, let's get to work on the most cornate parts, the axe. No, not that sort of axe, I'm talking about a real corn style axe, so let's hit it. As any good devotee to corn, it's all about the big bad axes. So to create the axe, we'll be using the original chainsaw in the night set snip the piece out and clean up any sprue markings. The next part is breaking the sword into two pieces. For this, we'll be removing the bladed side from the body of the sword. So using a sharp knife, I'll mark a clean line down the crease, a few firm passings, and then we can break the pieces apart. Now they are separated, we can glue the matching sides together and start to clean up the cut markings on both sides. The next step is sanding down the counterparts which will be placed against each other. So taking a flat sanding stick, the body of the sword and the sword are sanded. With the pieces sanded, we can now dry fit the pieces using the original joint of the body of the sword. Once we are happy with the fit, it's now time to glue these pieces together. The next part is now to create a cap to seal off the top of the axe blade. And to do this I'll be using some plastic card. Use a ruler and a sharp knife, and now I'll cut a clean straight piece which can be shaped to create the cap. Now with the cap glued and dried, I'll use the clippers and sandpaper to shape and carve the piece into a more uniform shape matching the profile of the axe blade. This involves the front of the axe, the top and also the edges. The same process is also repeated for the underside of the axe head. The next major part is creating the handle which will fix into the axe head. And to do this, we'll be using brass rods. So, using the rotary tool, I'll drill and create a hole matching the same size as the brass rod. With that now done, the cut brass rod is then filled with superglue and the rod is then inserted into the axe head. At this point, I decided to cut the brass rod at a 45 degree angle, just to give the profile some shape and character but you can cut the piece straight. The next part is adding an additional power line. And to do this, I used a paper clip. Unfold the clip and then bend the piece into the shape you wish to make. Now, to finish the length of the handle, I inserted a smaller brass rod into the original and then used the opposite side as the extension. Once the rods are in and letting the glue set, this is how the axe is currently looking. The next part is adding some more decorative flare aspects to the handle. And to do this, I'll use the paper clips and add some smaller rods into the handle. Once we are happy, it's time to cut the rod to the right length. Now it's time to spruce the axe handle. And to do this, we'll be using K&S tube assortments. At this point, all we will be doing is adding a varying amount of tubes and connections in a layering pattern. Here, let your creativity take over. There is no right or wrong way to place these pieces together. So just have fun. With this done, all I'll do now is add a very large spike to the base and I'll call this axe done. So let's move on to the next piece. Now, because this is the largest surface area on the model, most of the detail is going to come from the paint scheme. However, I wanted to add some elements of battle damage and worn effects. 
So, to achieve this, I first cut out the original piping on one side, leaving a large empty void, ready for what's coming next. The next part is to drill out the ends of the pipes and then insert some brass rods to mimic the pipes. The pipes are then cut quite crudely and then bent in a random manner. With these two main pipes done, I'll add some plastic card to the base to seal off the wide opening. This allows us to fix more of the bursting pipes along this edge. With the plastic in place, I'll now cut and bend a random number of pipes in this area. There is no pattern, so the more random we are, the better. This was done using different shapes and sizes of the rods, so lots of drilling, lots of bending, and lots of cutting. And this is how the carapace is currently looking. All that's left to do is start working on the top hatch. While the Abominant has a top hatch with chains, I wanted to go with a more blown effect. And to do this, I'll be using the clean hatch. However, I'll run the bottom edge over a flame to warp and distort the plastic. Just be careful while you're doing this. The next part is punching a hole through the hatch. And to do this, I'll heat up a piece of brass and then press this through the piece from the underside. This will help mimic an internal explosion punching the pipes and wires out. With the shape now done, I'll add some rods to fill the void, and then we can move on to the next piece. For one of the shoulders, I wanted to add a custom symbol onto the shoulder. I'll go through and remove the detail and features on one of the shoulders. This includes the spikes, the bulges, and also removing part of the trim. This will leave us with a clean canvas. Now this step may take a little time, so go back and forth from the knife and the sandpaper. Once we have a smooth enough surface, we will now backfill the holes with some melted plastic. Let this set, and then again go back to the sanding. Now we are left with a clean shoulder pad ready for the symbol. So in order to create this symbol, I had an idea of creating a mold and then pressing some green stuff into the mold. This didn't work as well as I hoped. So instead, I created a stencil and then stuck this onto some plastic card. So I uh, wasted a lot of time on designing this mold. And that's a lot of time in the designing, in the printing, in the pressing, and even playing around with the green stuff. And I really thought this process was gonna work. <laughs> Maybe it's me just thinking I was being a bit clever. But in the end, I was left with, with this. Is that it's awful but anyway maybe this is an idea that we'll try and look at it look at elsewhere i mean the idea wasn't totally in vain we managed to get a stencil out of it and then we moved on and put it onto the plastic card anyway but uh i guess i guess i should have just 3d printed the the symbol way more creative with the stencil now stuck down I'll give it a little spray, and now we have a perfect outline of the symbol ready to be cut. With the piece now cut, we are left with a good enough looking symbol ready to be glued. In order to prep the plastic, both sides are sanded to give the glue a bit more area to grip onto. The next step is to then line up the piece and start bending gently so the piece matches the profile of the shoulder. With the piece now glued down, I'll go back through and sand the piece down to match the rest of the trim. The next step is to add some spikes and teeth onto the symbol. And I'll use some green stuff to make some small spikes and teeth. These are then glued into place in a random pattern all along the symbol. Next, I'll cut down some cocktail sticks and glue them into place. Nice and spiky. As for the opposite shoulder, a simple chain draped along the shoulder is a good enough feature. I have big plans for this side of the night and I didn't want to overdo the features. The final part I wanted to add is some chains for the underside of the shoulders. So to do this, I had designed and printed the chains. Nice and simple, as they fit into place quite nicely. With the shoulders now done, it's time to start working onto the next piece. Now, to deal with the melee arm, we have a few hurdles to get over. 
Firstly, the original hand is being used as the hand holding the axe. And even then, the hand is only right-handed, unless I had an Imperial Knight, which has the left-handed hand. But without that, I'll have to make do with what we have here. First things first, I'll cut off the thumb socket and then sand down the socket to match the profile of the whole hand. The next part is then to cut out a new thumb socket. This is done on the opposite side of the hand. To do this, I used the rotary tool to carve a round carving into the palm. With the shape carved, the thumb will now click into place. Next, I'll add the fingers and pose them into a grasping, reaching pose. As for the arm, I'll repurpose the original arm of the sword arm, but I'll cut off the socket which would connect into the sword. Now, to really get that ravaging design I wanted, I'll be adding some tendrils from the Forge Fiend. These are added onto the upper portions of the arm. These will be reaching out forward, following the way the hand is reaching out. Now, some of these connections are crude, but that shouldn't matter, as these parts are going to be hidden by the shoulder and the draping chains anyway. So, make sure you get a good, nice, strong connection, and then let all the glue cure. As for connecting the hand to the arm, I'll carve and then glue a brass rod into a hole. This will connect the hand and the arm together. Now, I wanted the claws on the hand to be a bit more menacing. So, I'll replace them with the current ones with some larger claws. To do this, I'll use the claws from the original hand armor panel. So a quick clean cut and then a small adjustment is made for them to connect. Now this hand is starting to look much more menacing, but to finish the look off, we'll be adding some brass rods in a lengthy extended manner. A larger buckle and then a longer rod extending past the knuckles. This is repeated multiple times. Finally, these are all wrapped up with a model chain. With the arm done, let's move on to the next piece. To deal with the shin armor, the first thing I'll do is remove the extended trim on the shin completely. To do this, I'll use a sharp knife and sandpaper to get a smooth finish. The next part is to add some extra detail onto one of the shin armors. And for this, I'll use plastic card and cut out some chaos arrows. Once they are cut, the pieces are then bent and glued into place. Again, try not to be uniform in their placements and their shapes and sizes. The next part is adding some major battle damage onto the shins. And to do this, I'll use a rotary tool to carve in the shape of some serious damage. Again, at this point, we're trying to be as random as possible. This involves random depths, pressures, and sizes of the tearing. So if you are in doubt, you can always start light and then start to press heavier in areas that you're starting to feel more comfortable with. Just make sure you're being random. Once we have the carving done, I'll clean all the areas with Tamiya Extra Thin Glue, just to clean up any of those burrs left behind. At this point, we are mostly done with the sculpting and building of this model. So here's how the model is starting to look like. Already, you can start to see some of the character coming from this model and its pose. Now, the legs have been reposed and a waist extender has been used. Without further delay, let's get this primed and ready for painting. Now, with all the works we do, we will be starting by priming the model red. It gives us a perfect starting point, especially when we're working with metals. The next main color we are going to base the skeletal frame is dark warm gray from Pro Acryl, but you can use Eschen gray instead. With this base coat, we are mostly aiming to coat the entire model from above. We still want some of that red showing through, almost as if the gray is just a tint over the red primed base. So you don't need to worry about getting the base coat down into all of the crevices and creases. We have many more steps to go through and plenty more paint to get down. I'll repeat this step on all of the skeletal parts. Now we are left with the base pieces. 
we'll get right into the weathering. So, using an airbrush, we'll be applying Dark Rust Deposit from AK Interactive. This is applied to the vast majority of the model. Something that we're trying to achieve is leaving a random varying range of opacity in this layer. So try and place a heavy amount in some places while leaving a thin amount in other places. This randomness will just add extra value to the end result in a very subtle way. There is no exact science in the placement, so you will need to think a little as to where you would want some of the areas to be heavier than others. Me again. Now, which one are you going to take a more seriously in? There is an exact science to how rust works. It, it depends on the types of materials, but because we're trying to paint metals, especially iron, steel, there is a way how rust works. But remember, this is art. We're just trying to be very creative and make what our eyes actually like to look at. The next step is now taking a toothbrush and we'll start to reduce this layer and blend it into the gray base coat that we have put down. In this stage, I'll brush the model downwards to begin with, just to get those subtle streaks started. Once the model has been reduced, I'll take a Q-tip saturated in white spirits and I'll gently brush over certain areas to remove the dark deposits completely. At this point, we don't want any spirits freely running away in large pools, as it will take the dark deposits along with it. Again, at this stage, we aren't looking to be perfect, so go through the motions slowly and see where you are left at the end. Once you are happy, varnish the model with matte varnish and then let it dry. The next step is taking medium rust deposits and repeating the same process over again. But this time we want to reduce the coverage from the dark deposits. Keep this layer narrow and slightly confined into the dark deposits area. Now this layer will dry very bright, but don't worry. We will be reducing this and thinning the layer into our dark deposits. With the pieces covered, we will again go back to the toothbrush. This time we are trying to remove as much as possible while leaving the deeper recesses. So be gentle, but give the model a nice long scrub. Once the scrubbing is done, the next step is using a Q-tip with white spirits. Again, we are looking to clean any areas we aren't happy with and any wider, flatter areas returning the model back to the original grey. Keep in mind that we still want our colour variation. So even if the rust doesn't read correctly, sometimes all it needs is a little alteration. A small amount of spirits and then move on. We still have to bring this metal back to life next. Once we are happy, the model will get another matte varnish. Now the next step is bringing out that metal. And to do this, I'll use AK Interactive True Metal Gun Metal Grey. And with this, we're going to be buffing the paint onto the model, almost like we are dry brushing. However, we need to ensure the pigment is worked more into the brush and depositing a very faint amount of the pigment. So instead of pulling the brush in one direction, we are circling the brush. And as you can see, there is a very small amount left in the brush. At this stage, it's ready to go onto the model. I'll do the same motion all over the model. This may take a while, but you can go forever with one loaded brush. At this point, you may notice that the paint isn't depositing as much. And as we can see, the brush is actually quite clean. 
That's because the brush has deposited all of the pigments. Once we get to this stage, it's time to load the brush and then go again. So with all this in mind, let's get the skeleton covered. Currently, this is how the skeleton is looking. It's starting to look much better. We have the clear rust and dirt, the variation in the colors, the dark basing, and then the metal now registering as a dull metal. But we can take this even further. This time round, we're going to be using AK Interactive's True Metal Steel. This color is a lot brighter than the previous color that we've just put down. Now, the process is exactly the same. Load the brush, clean the brush, and then buff the model. This time, we want to try and catch the raised areas and the wider, flatter parts. So a light passing touch is all we need. Again, this is going to be done all over the model, so take it slow. We can now see the skeleton becoming very bright and punchy. All the edges are picked out, the bolts are highlighted, and the wider areas stand out. Once we are finished with this layer, we can now put the skeleton to the side and move on to the armor panels. The first color we are going to be putting down is Field Blue from Vallejo. This will act as our first base coat on all the armor panels. This color will mostly be used for the edges and the crevices, so a quick basing is all we need here. The next color is using orange ochre, and this color is focused more into the central spots of the armor panels. We don't want to cover entirely the field blue we've just previously put down. Make sure there are still some hint underneath. The next color is using pale sands, and this is used on the flatter, wider areas mostly concentrated into the center. With this color, we will want to slightly overlay the ochre and also tint the original field blue in some areas. The final color is adding ivory from Pro Acryl, and this is reserved for the highest points where the light would touch. Some small touches here and there, just to punch the contrast of the armor up. With all the basing done, this is how the armor is currently looking. Fairly bland, but this will act as a good primary base color for what's to come next. For the paint scheme, I wanted to mix this bland off-white into the blood red of corn. And to do so, I'm going to split this model right down the middle with a little flare. So, taking some masking tape, we will now make a stencil, put the tape down, overlap each layer, and then do a smooth cut along the edge. With the blanket now done, we will test fit the stencil, making sure we get the right angle and line. Once we know what we want to achieve, we will then remove the stencil and start to draw an outline of the pattern we want to do. For this model, I wanted a simple chaos arrow which is flipped into each color. So a few lines drawn, a little cutting, and we are left with an arrow cut from the stencil. Now, I'll put the stencil back onto the model, making sure I'm following the original line that I tested the first time round. As for the cutout arrow, this will be added into the opposite side. But before we start working on applying the next color, I'll put down a layer of chipping medium from Vallejo. This will help with the weathering of this new paint layer after. Because this paint is quite gloopy, I'll thin the chipping medium down with some thinner and then apply a nice healthy coating. Give it a few minutes to dry and now we can start to put down our next color. Here I'll use mahogany from Pro Acryl. This is mostly used on the edges and the crevices. The next color is using burnt red from Pro Acryl. This color is more focusing into the center points. Make sure some of the mahogany is still left behind. Finally, we will add the highest value of red. But before we can do this, we will apply a thin white layer where the brightest red will be applied. Make sure you are controlled in this placement. Once that layer is down, we can then apply bold pyrrole red from Pro Acryl. This is applied in a very thin passings, slowly building up the red over the white we've just previously put down. Giving the paint a few minutes to dry, we can now peel off the stencil. So in three, two, one.
very nice. Now, with some of the bleeding, I wouldn't worry. We put down a lot of chipping medium and this can easily be cleaned, but most likely this will end up being chipped away anyway. So without further ado, we can start the process of chipping this paint layer off. In order to do this, we'll be using an old small brush and a toothpick. Now, there isn't any right or wrong way in performing this step, but it's good to understand how this process works. The chipping medium is reactivated by water, but the chipping medium also creates a soft barrier preventing the overlapping paint from drying entirely. So, if you want larger chips, then adding water first and then picking the paint away. But other times you may not want the large chips. So going in with a toothpick first, just to scuff the paint and then applying the water afterwards. This will create a much finer chipping effect. Now both methods work and both methods are used. So play around with it first. Just don't go scraping and scrubbing too hard right away. Now, if you do end up applying too much water and notice the paint peeling and bubbling like this, do not fear. Just simply use a hairdryer and blast the spots with some heat. This will cause the chipping medium to evaporate quicker and it will also cause the top layer of paint to shrink back into the model. Once you are all calmed, just continue as normal. Now this process can take some time to get a good effect. So I'd suggest kicking back listening to something and let the process take its time. It can be very therapeutic with the end result. Now that you've seen the entire process done on one piece of armor, the same process is repeated on a random amount of armor panels. Simply mask off, press the edges, apply the chipping, paint, and then chip away. Once this is all done, it's time to move on to the weathering steps. Now the first step in applying some weathering is taking a torn piece of sponge and I'll be dabbing Rhinox hide to certain areas and edges of the armor, keeping this to a very light touch. Once that's done, it's time to get back in the booth. This time we're applying rusting streaks from AK Interactive and we're going to be applying this in a varying coat. Some areas are thin, some areas are thick. Perform this all over all of the panels. Now we can get into the reduction step. To do this, we'll be applying a coat of white spirits all over the armor panel, making sure the whole area is saturated. Next, we'll take a thick bristled feathering brush and run this along the panel in one direction. This will scratch the surface, causing the white spirits to run along the streaks. Now we can take a Q-tip and start to remove the rusts in a controlled pattern. So here we are trying to remove more from the flat areas and leaving the streaks to lead into the cracks and crevices. This process is repeated along all of the armor panels. When it comes to the shin armor pieces, I wanted the rust to be running in and from the damage that we carved in. So we'll spend a bit more time moving and manipulating the rusts in this area. Once we are happy, we'll let this layer dry and then apply a layer of matte varnish. The next step is adding some depth into the recesses. And to do this, we'll be using Abtalung 502 Bitumen and Starship Filth. Thin this down with some white spirits and then drop the mixture into the cracks and edges. Because this mixture is very thin, the surface tension will pull the pigments easily. So don't worry if the mixture overruns, it can be easily cleaned away. The next stage is using light rusts and applying this into the areas where we applied the Rhinox hide. What we're trying to achieve here is a very thin layer over this area just to cause a slight bit of tinting. The reason I'll do this with oils over an acrylic is I can easily manipulate the streaks and the tones while also feathering the pigment, also giving a more of a realistic look. So in this step, I'll be going back and forth from the oil to the white spirits.
Next, I'll apply a concentrated amount of the streak in rust to certain areas following the same method as to the light rusts. Using the brush, this will be applied controlled but heavily. Once it's down, we will again go through with a Q-tip and streak the enamel. As we did before, the shins will be getting a little bit more of an attention due to the carvings that we did. So this time we'll be applying a large amount of the rusting streaks and then we will stipple the enamel out, adding small amounts of the spirit in between to thin the mixture along the flatter area. The same process is followed when painting the deep parts of the carvings. With the armour panels now mostly done, it's time to start painting the metals and trims of the armour. Firstly, the pipes are based using the same colours we did for the skeleton, and the trim is then based in mahogany. This will give us our solid colour when we start to apply the metals and the weathering. With the trim now based, we'll start to apply our metals. Again, we'll be using AK Interactive's True Metal Copper, and this will be buffed onto the model. This time round, we are trying to avoid the recesses, only focusing the copper onto the high spots and the flat areas. We want to avoid the edges and keep the original base colour showing through. Now, if you accidentally apply this paint onto an area you didn't want to, do not worry. Simply take a Q-tip with white spirits and gently clean the metal off. It's nice and easy. As for the thinner trims, a smaller brush is used. Just be gentle and have a little bit of patience. This process is repeated along all of the armour panels. Next, I'll apply another metal. This time it's brass. This is reserved for the highest spots and the flattest areas, but we also want to blend this into the copper, giving the effect of the metal rippling. So I'll start adding the colour to the brightest spots, and then I'll slowly move out from there. Sometimes randomly touching random areas. This is just to give the metal some variation. Now finally, I'll use silver to touch the highest edges and corners. This is a very reserved application, so only add this to the corners facing towards the light. We should now be left with a nicely coated trim with lots of variation and depth, but we still got to add the weathering, so let's get to work. So to weather the brass, we're going to take a slightly unrealistic approach and we're going to use copper oxide blue patina and reduce this down into a very thin mixture. We will want to apply this mixture randomly and into the majority of the cracks and crevices along the copper and brass. So apply the mix and then use spirits to feather the edges into the metal colour. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that the spirits is actually reacting with the oils and the metal colouring just as we are feathering the edges with the oil. The spirits is also pushing some of the metal pigments aside, showing the mahogany underneath. This is just giving it more depth and emphasizing the weathering streaks even more. Once we are happy with the blending, we will add more concentrated coloring into the center of all of the patina streaks. This process is repeated along all of the trimming edging. The last metal to deal with is the remaining pipes and steel work. Again, this is the same as the skeleton, using AK Interactive's True Metal Gun Metal and then highlighting with steel. Once this is dry, I'll apply weathering and texture with the remaining oils used over the armour panel. Now, I wanted to put a small amount of effort onto the head and that work is on the eyes. I wanted one eye to be nice, bright and punchy and then I wanted to work on the other lens. So to begin with the lens, I'll mix green and blue to make a dark mixture. This is used to base the first eye lens. Once the base is dry, I'll make multiple washes of greens and blues. These mixtures are thinned excessively as we only want to tint the top surface. After many, many layers, a small white dot and a fleck is added to the edge of the lens. And now we're left with a nice looking lens which no one will actually see. Great effort. The next aspect to paint is the axe, and for this I wanted to mimic hazard stripes. 
So the axe was masked off and then a solid coating of chipping medium is placed just before we base with golden yellow from Pro Acryl. Once the coating is dry, I'll add light rust wash from Vallejo into the edges. The next step is to start chipping. So using a toothpick and a brush, and this will be slowly chipped away. Now, I want there to be an excessive amount of damage, but I also don't want to lose the bright and nice yellow we've just put down. So we're gonna have to play and find a happy medium. Once the chipping is done, it's time to mask off the stripes. With the axe masked off, I'll use cold black from Pro Acryl and put a solid coating down. Remember to put the chipping medium down before. With the base coat dry, it's time to peel the tape revealing those nice stripes. And now we can get back to the chipping. With this layer, we want to reduce the black down to the yellow. So be gentle and start to reduce the black stripes. With the body of the axe now done, we will start working on the metal. For the body, we will do the same process as we did with the trim. Base and mahogany, buff copper, buff brass, then pick out the edges with silver. As for the teeth of the axe, again, this will be done in the same way as we did the pipes. Now, to add some variation onto the night and this scheme, I wanted to paint the power coils and power packs in a nice bright green to complement the red that we've just used. So, for this I'll first use green from Procryl and base the areas broadly but thinly. Next is adding golden yellow into the green and adding this inside the green we've just put down before. This process is repeated multiple times until we are just left with a small fleck of yellow in the middle. Now this can't be one of my night videos without adding some dirty down rusts. This is reserved for the cracks and small openings along the metals on the armor and pipes. Add a drop, then use water and feather this out. Now at this point, this has been a lot of painting. So this is how the armor panels currently look. Now let's give the armoring a break and let's start working on the base. So to start on the base, we had already vaguely made the base back when we posed the legs. To do this, we used T coasters which I've made of cork. The next step we need to do is mark out where the feet are in the cork, as we're going to model and shape up the dirt and the impaction of the feet. With the markings done, we can now start working on adding the texture. To do this, we're going to be using a few tools. Smart Mud XL 2.0, Mod Podge, and some ground dirt found from outside. First, we're going to coat the entire base in Mod Podge, and then sprinkle a healthy layer of ground dirt. Next, we'll add some diluted Mod Podge all over the dirt, and then drop isopropyl alcohol over the glue to break the surface tension. This will now force the glue down and around all of the dirt, binding it into the base layer of glue that we first put down. Now, we do need to wait for the base to dry, so you may need to leave this for a good few hours. Once it is dry, we'll now be taking the Smart Mud and applying this all over the top of the dirt that we've just glued down. The reason we put the dirt down first is, this gives the Smart Mud some extra texture to bind to. Also, it forces us and the Smart Mud to not be so uniform, giving up random elevation and ridges. So I'll apply the Smart Mud all over the area, following the markings that we've put down of the original footprint. Once we have tested the footprint, we will then apply the diluted Mod Podge back over the Smart Mud, and then sprinkle on the dirt again. This will give an already random elevation even more texture and area. The same process is performed as before. Add the dirt, add more diluted glue, add the isopropyl alcohol, and then let it all dry. Next, I'll work on adding some features onto the base. The first feature is doing a custom barbed wire. And to do this, I'll use paper clips. 
stretch them out, and then I'll use pliers to hold the two ends together. From here, I'll then twist the pieces together by hand, slowly winding the two wires together. Once that's done, I'll bend and twist the wires around the tip of the pliers, and then I'll model the wire to the shape that I wish. Now, because the majority of the base is cork, we can simply push the wire into the cork and it would fit firmly. The next feature I wanted to add were some wooden barricades. And to do this, we'll be using some coffee sticks. The first step is to cut these sticks down into smaller lengths, using a ruler and a sharp knife. The next step is then to start lining each piece up. Once they are lined, I'll use some masking tape to stick the pieces together for the time being. Next, I'll add a small bead of glue along one line and then stick another piece of wood acting as a post. And now we should be left with a fully made wooden wall. This step is repeated multiple times. Once we have the walls made, they are now cut and broken in order to get the effects that we wish. Now with everything in place, it starts to get into the painting. Just like everything else, the base is primed in red and then based using light grey from Pro Acryl. Next is adding filled blue into light grey. And then this is dry brushed over the whole base catching the raised areas. Now our next colour is adding ivory into the filled blue. And this is added onto the base slowly building up to just ivory. As for the lower portion of the base, I wanted this to be lava. So before we can start putting the paint down, we will add a thick and heavy layer of a texture paint. Using Agrelin Earth, I'll apply this using a coffee stick, making sure to add a very heavy amount onto the open area. Now, because I'm impatient, I'll speed up the process using a hairdryer. Once that's dry, I'll start working on adding the lava. The first color used is red. This is added to the whole area where the lava will be. The next color is then orange, and this is added in random spots amongst the red. Next is adding yellow, and this is added in between the orange. Now finally, I'll dry brush black over the top of the texture paint, and then I'll add black to the edges of the armor onto the stone flooring. With the lava now done, I'll add some extra lighting of the lava just for dramatic effect. So a little red, some orange, and then some yellow onto the edges. With the base now mostly done, it's time to add the extras we made earlier. Now, before we add them, I want to make some of them damaged and weathered. So let's burn them. Taking a flame, the wood fences are then scorched in random patterns. Once they are done, they're then fixed into the cork base. And just to add some effect, some random dried roots are also added along the opening of the base. Now with the entire model mostly done, here's how all the pieces are looking. All that's left to do is start putting them together. And for this, we'll work with building the legs and the base first, and then building the torso. So. Let's put on some fresh clean gloves and let's get building.
ladies and gentlemen. That's it. That's the show. What a wrap. I mean, it's not bad. It's not good. It's not bad. I guess we'll just have to see what we work on next. Maybe it's a unit. Maybe it's a vehicle. Maybe it's another night. Who knows? We'll see which one we're working on. We've still got two other nights to work on for this series. Oh, yes. This is the Four Horsemen. We've only made two. One other two left to do. I mean, like, yeah, sure, I've already made one from many, many moons ago, but we can spruce that up. We can turn it into a video. Right? Yeah. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the show. And um, until next time. <laughs>